Next up will be Jean-Marie, who will be talking about a project that aims to be the backbone for automated testing for Linux boot. So, give it up for Jean-Marie. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you for staying for this last talk. So, I was a little bit worried when I've seen the timing, but the, the room is still pretty crowded, so thank you very much. So my name is Jean-Marie Verdun. Um, as you can imagine, I'm French. I'm working for a US-based company now. And um, I am part of the Linux Boot Technical Steering Committee with Ron Minnick and Philip, who is um, part of Nine Elements. But I don't, I don't think that Philip is in the room, but it's fine. So um, I'm going to speak about a super boring subject, which is testing. So most of the time, engineers don't like to hear about testing. Um, but what I like to say is that before coding anything, we must be able to define how we are going to test. So I think it's really key, and you will understand why. So um, I started to work on the Linux Boot project about 18 months ago when um, I initiated um, a shift into my company, which was to move from a linear economy model to a circular economy model. So how many of you have ever heard about circular economy? One, so that's still a beginning. So, okay, <laughs> so that's that's pretty good to to be there then. So let me try to explain you what what is the circular economy model. Um, so you are probably aware about the fact that we are producing every year around eight million servers, plus. So um, regarding these eight million servers, about 2.5 millions are trashed every year. So that's a lot of trash. That's a lot of scrap. And um, when we started to look at the raw performances of this crap, we estimate that these performances were still far good enough to run some good applications. And there is a lot of people who are still lacking compute resources access. And we say that perhaps we can reuse this stuff. But reusing them requires us to upgrade them, keep them in good uh, operation mode. And um, roughly, the circular economy model introduced something which is slightly different than the produce, consume, and recycle. So we call that recycle. So that's just to have a positive image. But in the end, this is generating trash. To a produce, use, recycle, and update. So roughly, a whole system is going to have three to four lifetime. So from the compute servers, we can convert that to a storage box, then to a networking box, and something which is going to end up into edge computing. And then we can generate trash. So we started that project with some um, OCP hyperscaler members. So you can see there are a bunch of racks. So this is racks that we are currently processing. So roughly, they are decomed from uh, hyperscaler data centers. And uh, before we started that project, um, they were fully scrapped, except the CPU and the memory. So everything else was going to uh, scrap and generating landfill. Um, we, we, we quickly identified a massive issue. Even if they were running in production, so the firmware that, that they were coming with was really outdated and full of bugs and um, was not able to support latest uh, technology like booting on NVMe drives or anything else. So the key question was, uh, how can we get rid of the AMI system BIOS, which really sucks on these machines? So we, we started to think about it, and I went to a core boot developer meeting. I think this was in Denver about 15 months ago, yeah, in 2017, and uh, started discussion with Ron, who had some idea about uh, how to boot a, a Linux kernel quickly after the PEI and um, uh, stage within the UEFI stack. And we started to work together uh, to run a POC, a proof of concept on the Winterfell machine, just to see if it could work. And I think it quickly worked. So in the end, we, we met first uh, in February, and we were able to boot a system in, uh, some, somewhere in June time frame, something like that. Um, when I say boot, so we got something on the serial port. So <laughs> let's, let's be reasonable. The thing is, when we are recertifi recertifying this machine, they, they are not handing up to a single customer. So they are really spreading everywhere around the world. And, and what is key to us is, is really system reliability and being able to upgrade the machine during the, the next generation of, of this uh, uh, life cycle. And um, 
And we were extremely worried about uh, using new technology for system bias, especially um, booting, uh, booting the machine, because this is the first thing that the machine is doing. So if it doesn't work, you cannot use the machine. And that's why quickly we discovered that we needed to put in place a CI which, which was going to uh, stress the systems, validate that Linux boot works properly, and that, the, that we could run regression testing. So this is the main goal of the, of the current CI project. So why we want absolutely to avoid, I think you know that, that image. Who knows it? Nobody? OK, that's good. So uh, you are aware that fixing a bug in production is a dangerous thing. So that, that, that's also why I'm really caring about testing uh, before entering production or before shipping product. So that the promise that we do to our end users is that if they are using a, a, one of our systems running Linux boot, so they are able to uh, deploy it in production. And we soon have system in production at customer sites running ERP system for, uh, for managing invoicing or managing uh, purchase orders and all these things. We are managing a car manufacturer uh, plan. So that's the other, that's the other uh, challenge that we faced. So we couldn't build and rely on testing with a basic hardware setup uh, with a technician in a lab which was running a test plan. I I've seen that many times at ODM sites where the guy who is testing the MI firmware image which has been built by one of its colleagues is just in front of a keyboard and run a, a bunch of tests following a, a test procedure on, on a piece of paper and running check marks. That's OK, that's OK, that's not good, and, and, and so on. It happens many times. And this, this does explain why also, in some cases, the EMI image which are provided are not really good. So EMI source code, in some way, can work pretty well. But it has to be set up properly. So that's the thing. And, 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 and roughly what happened in many times is that the person who is setting up is under rush, is producing an image, and it goes in the, in the field without having properly tested. So what is the goal of the project? The goal of the project is to be able to build a, a replicable environment to generate Linux boot images. So let's imagine that in one year, somebody is coming back to us telling us, I got a bug, so this is the version I'm running. Can you fix it? So if we are unable to rebuild that version, that's an issue. So right now, Linux boot is fully managed using GitHub. So we can use the tagging. We can use all the GitHub features to keep track of history. But the, the thing is, we still need to be able to uh, rebuild without um, while being sure that the binary that we generate is exactly the same. So that's, that's one of the goals of the CI. Um, then we, we have to fully automatize the test. I don't want a human in the middle just running tests and telling me it works. And if the guy is, uh, is tired, he's going to go fast, and he's going to make mistakes, and he will tell me it works. <laughs> so I've seen that many times either. So <laughs> and, and, and if it is automated, uh, automated so we can, we can rely on something which is replicable. The other thing, if we automatize the testing of the firmware, we think that we can scale without any issue. So if you have one guy, 10 guys, 100 persons which are testing, so you, you are still limited by your human resources. So if you have automated systems, so the, the only one limit is the capacity of your data center to accept new uh, testing nodes. So that's the, that's the thing. And uh, the last thing is we need to be able to support multiple hardware generation. So right now, we are getting Xeon V1, V2, V3, V4, and even Skylake as DCOM system, so, which means that that's, that's a very wide range of systems. And, and um, if we do that by hand, this is just going to be a nightmare. So I don't remember exactly how many uh, commits happened on Linux boot, but I think this was uh, higher than 300 or 400, something like that. So each time we get a commit, we have to run testing on 10 different platforms with different revisions, different test environments. So that, that doesn't work. So either we, we, we selected the, the options to test only on one single system, hoping that it will work on the others, or we, we, we use a brute force approach, which is let's put online a bunch of servers and test every time we get a new commit on these machines and get feedback from the machines. So that's, that's really the goal of the, of the platform. So we started the development about, uh, I think, in January. So we are in September, nine months ago. So that's work in progress. We still have uh, a, a lot of things to do, but 
Quickly, we decided to run uh, the development through a web API so we can get connected pretty easily to GitHub. So what we want is, is roughly that a firmware developer who is going to push for a new commit on GitHub doesn't have to know anything about what's going on to get a testing result. So it will just get a green light or red light. And if, if this is a red light, it can get access to a log file telling him what, what went wrong. And uh, we even do schedule to offer um, remote access to machines, which, which went wrong for debugging purpose. So like that, the uh, end users will be able to, um, to identify from where the issue can come from. So this is not ha happening really often on CI testing platform currently. So you just get a log most of the time, and you have to rerun your test. So we thought that for firmware testing, it might be useful to get access to machine, especially if you want to test features like does NUMA is enabled or not. So Linux Boot is able to provide you a shard, so getting access to the interactive shard might be uh, pretty useful. So the first thing is the Web API. Then we have a, a job controller, which is just scheduling tasks in a step-by-step -step approach. So we build, we build an image, then we validate that, it, that this image is not going to break the node. So this is a live testing on real hardware. And then we have some basic feature validations. So the node is up and running. So we check that the SCPI turbo is properly set up and, and decoded. We check that NUMA works. So we check that we can detect the PCI and, and that it matched the system configuration expected. And then we go up to the, the operating system stability and stress test. So we want to boot the operating systems. And right now, we are testing with uh, Ubuntu and CentOS. And we, we are checking that this OS feels comfortable on top of Linux boot. So that's, uh, that's something which is also key, because all end users are running an operating system. So they're not running a firmware. And we must be sure that the operating system is able to work properly. I got some requests to support Windows. So up to now, we say no. <laughs> but uh, I, don't know, I don't know what will be the future. So roughly, we are just supporting Linux on top of Linux boot up to now. Um, I should have said at the early stage that everything that we are doing is open source, so you can participate to this project, either on the hardware side or the software side. So feel free to contribute. So the current implementation um, is, uh, is based on popular open source project. So uh, as, the, um, as the infrastructure has to, has to scale uh, with uh, upcoming new hardware, so we used Ansible just to be able to add new, uh, to add new uh, capacity to the infrastructures. So everything which is uh, related to deployment of build machines or uh, test machines is, um, is implemented using Ansible. So we are, we are using also a lot of hardware. So we are trying to have more than one node for each generation of platforms, because we are expecting that some of them are going to break, whatever happened. And we are scheduling batch with Slurm, so which is a well-known uh, scheduler in HPC. And um, for the build, we are using uh, KVM, so everything is virtualized, so we can, we can build on a well-known system environment. And uh, if we have to support something new, so we, we are pretty flexible on that approach. And uh, roughly to set up your own CI, you just, you just need to have an Ansible master node, a Slurm controller, a Slurm batch node, and then after a couple of testing nodes, so that's the, and that's it. Um, one of the goals is to offer the capacity to ODMs and OEMs just to pick up that testing environment, deploy it in-house in, in their own infrastructures, and being able to run their own test and even submit their results. So we, we know that for upcoming platforms, so there is a lot of NDAs for, from chip vendors or whatever. And we, we cannot go against that. But we want them to be able to test Linux boot on top of this new generation of platforms and provide feedbacks to the community. And if an end user ends up to, prof, uh, to purchase this product, it will be able to know straightforward if the, if the product has been officially tested or not. So that's, that's part of the goal. And we are going to put in place uh, a dashboard to uh, check what has been tested or not. So the web API so is, is something which is 
pretty simple. So right now, it, it does provide job control. So you can launch a job, you can kill it, you can list it, you can have a look to the log files. So what is key um, is if you want to contribute, you have to know Go, or you have to learn Go, or accept the idea to use Go. <laughs> um, that's, that's a trendy language. So I was not knowing, knowing Go before starting that project. So the guys from Google told me, if you want to work on that stuff, you have to work on Go. So let's do Go. <laughs> I, I, I honestly do not care about the language selection. As long as this is a high-level language, it could have been Go, Python, or any, a, anything else. So that, uh, that, that is doing the job, so w which is key. So right now, everything which is on these slides is, uh, is available. So the controller is also available. So we can preset beyonds, we can store job status, and, uh, and you can launch jobs without, uh, without any issue. Uh, the, the controller is, uh, is relying on, uh, on Slurm. So there's something which was important to us, which was to save um, runtime. So most of the jobs are run in memory. So if your job doesn't require more than 40 gig of storage space, so we allocate that stuff in memory, and, uh, and the job is fully run in memory. So we, we do not care about saving the results. So if you want to save the results of your executions, you have to take care about that things and run, run a, a, a copy command at the end of the job. So that's the, that's the key things. Um, all of our VMs, uh, which are used within the infrastructure, have access to the internet. And we have a local pr uh, proxy cache for um, package for the distribution. So either you go to the internet and you upload the latest versions because you want to test with the latest versions of some packages, or you, you want to rebuild something that you know and you can use our, our, our proxy cache. So that's the, that's the idea. Um, so we set up the remote access to the VM through the Slurm, which uh, we thought at the early stage would be easy. And it ended up to be a very complex thing because we had some port forwarding and uh, a lot of firewalls rules, which were much more complicated than we were expecting. And then we can initiate the job execution. So the builder has two main goals. Um, one is either to build the Linux distro uh, kernel for a Linux boot support and uh, for specific hardware support. So just to give you an example, there is a specific TTY for uh, the serial console on OCP nodes, which is um, serial 4. Don't ask me why. So 0 is, no, is not rooted. So you have to use 4 and 0. 0 is, uh, zero is the IPMI, and uh, 4 is the serial. So the one which is useful for uh, BIOS developers is mostly the real serial, not the IPMI one, uh, because most of the time you are killing the IPMI, and that's the, that's the issue. So we need to adapt the, the, the kernel. And you can use the builder to, just to rebuild a kernel for your distro. But the thing is, um, we, we run an initial implementation based on the Tram uh, Hudson works. So we rely currently on OS Research Heads build. So we use um, uh, the scripts which are there. So run is nothing. But <laughs> Uh, that, the, the thing is the last sentence, I think. So that, that, stu that stuff is using Makefi. So um, who is more than 40 in that room? Oh, shit, I'm really old. <laughs> oh, Ron, you should raise your hand. So you are more than 40. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the, the, the thing is the make file works properly, but they are in some way a little bit complex. Let's, let's say that through that, that approach. So I, I don't want to get Trump upset about his work, so that's the thing. <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of people are complaining about the fact that um, they are not that easy to understand or maintain. I honestly like them, but I'm more than 40, so I grew up with make files. So that's the thing. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's why we're thinking about um, either improving that or changing the way we are building. But right now, it's working like a charm. You can build everything from scratch in less than 10 minutes on that infrastructure, so, which, is, which is pretty good, even, even um, including the kernel build. So that's a, that's a fast build, and that's good enough for a CI infrastructure. So we are um, user space agnostic, so we run. So we build NERF, and we are able to build also HIT. 
So just a quick feedback. Linux boot um, is a Linux kernel plus some user space environment, which is providing um, and user uh, basic commands for the firmware. So there is, a, there is one which is called Nerf. It's based on Uroot, and this is written in Go. And there is one which is called HID. It's based on uh, um, C library and uh, Buzzybox, if I'm not wrong. No, I'm, you didn't get upset, so I'm right. <laughs> and uh, both of them are uh, tested and uh, supported within the CI infrastructures, and we are able to validate that it works properly. Um, so the node break validation is probably the most interesting one, or at least for us. So because up to now, the current CI within the GitHub is just validating that we can properly compile a firmware image. So, and we get a firmware image, so we are super happy about that. And, and that's the, this is where the engineer is telling me it works. And this is where I told him, no, you have to test it. And, and he's answering me, it does compile, this is go, so it works. <laughs> and, and, and I'm always trusting things that I can see working, so that's, that's really key. So the first step is to launch the image for QMU when we can. But the, the last step is really to use um, real hardware. So we set up this system environment for the Winterfell node. So just to give you a quick background, the Winterfell is just a basic two CPU, Xeon, V1, V2 um, infrastructure. It doesn't have any uh, BMC support. So the BMC features are supported through the Intel ME. And uh, we, we, we scaled the uh, CI infrastructure through a DigiProg EM100 Pro Flash emulator. I know that stuff costs money, but it was readily available on the market. And we, we can upload as many images as we want, so that's pretty valuable. And we connect the emulator to the, SP, uh, to the SPI interface from the Winterfell machine. So we had to run some hardware hacks, because uh, even if this is an open hardware platform, there is no um, spy header on this machine. So we, we removed um, uh, the flash socket, and we soldered down uh, some cables uh, in place of the flash socket. So, but it works. And then we got the console, which is sent back to a controller node, and we have a USB switch. So a lot of people are asking me, why do we have this USB switch? That's because the goal of the CI is to validate that everything works. And when I mean everything, we must be able to boot on USB. It could look like crazy, but we still have some customers who are booting servers on USB, especially if you are an SMB company. So you don't have that many servers than uh, hyperscalers. You just run 20 servers. And you don't deploy um, complex infrastructures uh, just for uh, booting. And you rely on your USB stick. So we are testing that we can boot on USB. We can boot on RG45, SFP+, which is a Melanox card, with IPXE, which is something which really sucks. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I really enjoy Andrea works regarding the, the boot node. And uh, we are also testing that we can boot on NVMe. Uh, just to give you a feedback, and this is where I like and I love uh, Linux boot. So Winterfell stock firmware image is totally um, incapable of booting with NVMe drive. So it doesn't know how to boot from NVMe. So with Linux boot, we can have the NVMe driver preloaded within the Linux boot kernel, and we can k-exec a new kernel which is sitting on NVMe drives. And this is really giving new opportunities and new market access to the Winterfell machines. So especially for low-cost VMs, so which are looking for fast storage, local fast storage. So we do have customers also which deploy that with uh, hyper-converged uh, system configuration under OpenStack. So that's, that's, that's really different way to use this machine. So, and roughly, we call that um, a CI compute resources. So the compute resources is the whole infrastructures. So that's two servers, one which is taking care about the test nodes and looking at sending the right command to validate that the, the, the image is able to boot. And we are doing that for all OCP platforms. So either Winterfell or Leopard or Tiago Pass or all the upcoming hardware. Um, so uh, why do we test the OS? Um, what was funny at the early stage is we thought that everything would be working pretty well when we started Linux boot and uh, after the KI exec. But we quickly discovered that some basic features 
are not that easy to set up with Linux boots like uh, virtualization. So virtualization uh, requires um, some um, um, PEI, uh, UEFI uh, variable setups, which are extremely complex to do, <laughs> or because they are not documented. So that's the key thing. So you, need, you really need to try to understand what's going on and, and, and matching the various image. Um, then we got some NUMA feature support, which were uh, quite complex. The IO MMU, MMU setup was not that easy. And the only way to detect all of these minor issues was really to boot up the environment under the operating systems and try to deploy what our end users are going to deploy on top of that. There is still something which doesn't work right now on these machines. That's uh, GPU support. So each time we plug a GPU on a Linux boot machine, which is an OCP node, we are unable to start. So that's, that's work in progress. It's not even work in progress. That's a bug. But we, we, we will try to fix that later on. Um, so what are we able to support? So we are able to support all of that thing. So right now, most of the operating systems that we are shipping with our machine are based on uh, Ubuntu Xenial. So we got the net installers. We got um, the standard distro, which works. So the only one tricky thing is really to select the serial port to the right, to the right um, TTY. Uh, so what are we testing at the OS level? So I soon spoke a lot about it, but all of this is tested right now. So that's uh, the basic. Uh, yeah, CPU frequency management was also a little bit challenging. I don't know. I don't remember remember exactly what was the issue, but all of this is currently tested under the CI. So we, we, boot, we boot the kernel, and we, we have some basic testing which says it works, it doesn't work, or we, we, we get the, the information that we are uh, really looking for. So we test also network adapters, SRIOV, when it works, because <laughs> I just reported a couple of bugs with SRIOV on Melanox cards, so that's the, that's the things. And we are running uh, performance benchmarks, so like Linpack and PyStorm. So um, Python is really strange benchmark to me. So I don't, uh, that's that's a really strange computation. I don't know if you know that benchmark, but if somebody can explain me later on what what it is really doing, so that's uh, I'm, I'd be really interested. So Linpack is um is a very basic benchmark. So this is just a um, a solver which is inverting a matrix and uh, take work benchmark, I/O benchmark, and multiple VMs. So. So scaling the public CI. So we have all of this. We still are a small company. And one of our intent is, is to see Linux boot being a success. And we think that there is something which is slowed down adoptions of free software, like firmware, within corporations. And this is what happened when I'm discussing with the end users, potential end users, is is it really safe? Is it really runnable? I know all of you will tell me, yes, it is. But the only one way to prove that it is safe and reliable is really to go through an automated process, publish reports, telling this has been tested. And if it doesn't work, you, you, you can report a bug. And if we have the, the proper way to report the bugs, then it, it looks professional, and, and people are far much more comfortable at adopting the technology. So, and, and to us, Linux boot success is really key. Same thing for OpenBMC and other firmware stack. That's purely because. We cannot rely on a firmware which is no longer supported by ODMs and which are not properly set up for general purpose usage. And that's, uh, that's something which is, um, which is important. So the current cost of the public CI, why do I speak about money? So the, the, the key thing is that's a community project. And even if it is a community project, we, ha we are facing one basic issue. We speak about hardware, hosting hardware, scaling that stuff. So my company is one sponsor of that things, but I don't think we can sustain the growth and the needs of everybody um, alone. So that's, that's really key. And, and right now, this is what we have allocated to the project. So 20 servers, and, uh, and this is roughly the cost of the servers. That's not that expensive. They are recertified servers, second-hand machines. So, but if we had the Tiago Pass, if we had the Leopard, if we had all the, all the infrastructures that we want to have, or e even um, servers which are not from OCP, uh, that's, that's going to become complex. 
And um, what we are trying to do right now is to secure long-term hostings. And we, we have an estimation of 10K uh, US dollars cost per month. So this is including the racks, this is including the hosting facility and the people to manage the racks and all these things. So um, as being part of the technical steering committee of the project, we, we are exploring various options uh, just to find sponsorship. And um, one of the intent is not that my company drive that project um, in the long term. So we, we really want to bring that project to the community. And, and this is going to be transferred either to the Linux foundations where Linux Boot is currently hosted, or to any other nonprofit foundations when we estimate that we have fixed most of the issues. And one of the core issues is how can we run that CI uh, short term, mid term, and long term? So we, we need to fix the business model issues and find the right sponsorship model. So um, as this is work in progress, what is key is to collaborate. And as I told you, everything is public, so you can go on Linux Boot GitHub, and uh, you can commit code, and you can test the CI, you can complain. Um, don't hesitate to complain. We are French, and uh, French people are yelling like crazy, so we are used to complain. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's fine with the team currently. And, uh, and we, want you to, we, we want to see you testing your, your commit and testing your code. That's, that's really key. I, I, I really love the idea of open source firmware. I'm, I'm more worried about the adoption rate, and, and my job is really to be sure that we are providing in the field high quality software. I'm pretty optimistic on, regarding Linux boot. So we shipped about 700 servers running Linux boot right now. So that's a good reasonable numbers. And they are used for many different applications. And stability is great. So that's, that's the key things. And, and the only feedback that we got from the customers is that they don't see any difference with uh, other firmware, which is good. And, uh, and they are super happy about the idea that we can enhance uh, hardware support like the NVMe trick uh, I shared with you. I'm done with the slide. Thank you to come to the conference and staying up to now. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions. You earned that applause. The last slot is always the hardest. So we have some time for questions. So does anybody have a question about the project? Now everybody wants to no? have a drink. No one? Oh, two, three. Oh. So, oh. <laughs> Just have to wait. <laughs> so. so who was first? I'm, I'm not, I lost track. Now raise your hand. I think we don't remember who had a question, so that's the thing. <laughs> um, so did you look at existing um, solutions for this um, testing, like the lava stuff, I think, um, the lead Naru guys have, and um, uh, yeah, and integrated with Jenkins or whatever? Um, we, we didn't went up to, up to the framework level, so right now we, we really worked on the um, basic low-level features, uh, like um, how can we put an OCP nodes within a CI systems? What, what are the hardware requirements? What do we need to change on the, on the hardware platform? And then uh, what kind of infrastructure do we need to build everything? So that's why we set up the VMs. And, and what we thought was that getting the frameworks um, is more something which is dependent on the community who is going to use that stuff. So we, we are trying to find a way to, to get the options that people can select the framework they want to use on top of the infrastructure. So that's why um, when you are an end user, you can get access to the VMs. So that's the, that's the key things. That's slightly different from what you know within traditional CI. Yeah, I also wanted to pick on this topic, actually. Um, so I will specify specifically the topic of, of the build part. Um, you see that there are a lot of public builders out there, we could, like Travis CI, we can just use. So basically, if you give your users the, the description file, they build it for you, yep. or they can build it on their own, and you just need to, to manage basically the deployment of the artifacts afterwards to your test system. So you don't have to implement the infrastructure um, for these kind of things. There are also things you can host on your own. Travis is a public service. 
but there are also on-premise solutions for this. But just the idea is that you enable your, your users to reuse it at least for the build. Yeah. Um, I am used to use Travis for another project, so um, I am one of, of the big contributors of a project called FreeCAD. I don't know if you know that tool. So that's a CAD tool. Um, one of the issues we faced with Travis um, was the flexibility that we have um, regarding build time. So FreeCAD is a CAD tool, so if you want to build a global tool, it requires something like seven hours on Travis. So, which is extremely long, and you have a time limit for your build, which is about 30 minutes when it's free. So, when we faced that issue, we discussed a lot with Travis people and all these things. This has been a pain. I said, okay, on Linux boot, we need to rebuild kernels and all that stuff. I, don't want, I, I didn't want it to restart the discussion with the Travis folks or others and, and keeping our independence. Yeah, but we always run in CI jobs in GitLab. Yeah. Yeah. So the build time from all source. Oh, the build time from all source for Uroot to create an init ram fs is about 20 seconds. Yeah, that's and that, that's that pretty fast. 20 seconds. It includes rewriting all the programs. There, it's a, it's 99 separate programs. They're all rewritten into Go packages, and then that's compiled into one binary, and that's 20 seconds. So the thing about this kind of building is, you know, internally in our heads we think. Well, we need some kind of heavy-duty, great CI because it's a really big deal. But the, the, the building of the init RAM FS in, in this model is essentially zero cost. So, And the other things, we, we wanted to provide the freedom to the developers to build their firmware image on top of the software infrastructure they wanted to, de to design by themselves. Either Ubuntu, CentOS, or whatever, something which they can define. So we basically have two contradicting statements now. One was on your slides, you were saying that in order to support different systems, you need two more server systems per platform in order to do the builds. And now you're saying that the build is at zero cost. Yeah, that's the software build. So you need two servers for testing on real hardware. So there, there is two steps within the CI. So building the software image, the, the firmware. And when you get that firmware image, then we are uploading that on real hardware. We turn on the hardware and we test if the Go compiler has made a good work. So if you can boot up the machine and boot so up the product. So that part system. I understand. It was just about like you could think about splitting the build from, from your actually testing CI. And you know, my suggestion would have been OBS. I don't know how many, you know, like build time exactly uh, the packages have been, how many combinations that would be to just have something that gives you the binary results that you can then, once it's complete, feed into your CI system. Yeah, that's, we, ha we have that debate in, um, within the, the community, so which is, um, do we use the controller or not to build up everything? Do we keep track of what has been pre-built to accelerate things? So right now, this is a very basic implementation. So each time a new job is coming up, we are recompiling everything from scratch. We know that it's not optimal, but there's not that many developers on that project, so that's the other thing. So we, we need more time to accelerate the developments and, and improve uh, the features from the CI. So you mentioned uh, some hardware that you could also get access to the schematics, I assume, and, and Gerber files. Was that some? Sorry, can you speak a little bit oh, longer? Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> so you mentioned some hardware that uh, is also open source that has to do with the project. Yeah, we. Could okay, you just we go in we and... are we are part of the Open Compute project. So one of the goals of the Open Compute project is to try to design open source hardware. So that project has been launched in 2011 or 2012 by Facebook and a couple of industrial. And since the beginning, a lot of people are complaining that this is not real open hardware because it's lacking information and technical information. That is true. So I, I am really an open hardware guy. So my team is designing on free software like KiCad and FreeCAD. And we, we, everything that we do is open, and we are using, and, and we are building the tools that we need to do uh, to design the hardware. The, the thing is, it's always better to 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 work with people who are trying to do something, instead of ignoring them and and just try to do something alternatively. So that's that's the thing. So that's why we entered the Open Compute project, 
And we are quite happy about that. And, and the direction that the project is currently taking is, um, is a positive one. We, we can see more and more schematic coming up, more and more Gerber files. So my current fight um, is, um, is about the EEPROM content. So because if you do not know how the chipset is set up, so we, that's, you cannot reproduce the hardware. So my ideal goal is that you get access to all the information to manufacture an OCP motherboard from the files that are sticking on the OCP websites. You are still not able to do that because we are still lacking a few things. But um, let's keep working to improve that. Awesome. So by the way, there is an OCP summit in Amsterdam uh, on October 1st and 2nd. And we do have uh, an open source firmware track during that event. Ron is not there. So he, he's rushing home <laughs> before. <laughs> but uh, feel free to join us. And uh, you can complain about the lack of technical information. This is the place where you have to complain, because the people who are managing most of the hardware project will be there. And, and this is during this discussion we can improve things. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any more questions? Doesn't seem like it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Please give a big round of applause.